Now, what God does is, God comes and says, okay, Elijah, you got to do three things left. There's three things for you, Elijah, that you need to do yet because I've got 7,000. You aren't the only one, Elijah. You aren't the only one. There's 7,000. My prophets haven't bowed the knee to Baal. You need to get back your tail back up there and help those guys, you know? So, so he tells them, you need to do three things. You've got to anoint Hazael, who's the king of Syria, anoint the king of Syria. Secondly, you've got to anoint Jehu. Now, who is Jehu? Jehu is going to be a king that's going to come down the line, and he's going to take out Ahab and his descendants. Jehu is going to be the king that takes out Ahab's descendants. And then lastly, you've got to anoint the next prophet. You've got to anoint the next prophet. The next prophet's going to be Elisha. So Elijah is going to anoint Elisha, and kind of, it's almost like a prophetic baton is going to get passed from one prophet to the next. Have we seen that before? Moses passes the baton to whom? Joshua, okay? And what you have here is Elijah passing it on to Elisha. Elisha is kind of the understudy, and Elijah passes it on. So God says you've got to go up and anoint these guys and things, and so Elijah heads back up. Now, Naboth's vineyard, and I want to just hit this quickly, um, is in chapter 1 Kings chapter 21. This is a powerful story. Ahab goes out and looks at his, looks at his palace, and he looks out at his palace wall, and who's got a beautiful vineyard right next to his palace? A guy named Naboth. And Ahab goes up to this guy, Naboth, and he says, Hey, Naboth, I want your vineyard. I will pay you well for your vineyard. Just sell it to the king. It's okay. I want your vineyard. Sell it to the king. Naboth says what? I, I, king, I can't sell it to you. It, it's, it's like an inheritance from my parents, you know, and stuff, and from our family. I can't sell it to you. What's the king going to do? Well, in this case, the king didn't kill him. It says here, um, Ahab went home sullen and angry because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give it to you. He lay on his bed sulking and refused to eat. His wife Jezebel came in and said, why are you sullen? Why won't you eat? Jezebel comes and says, how come, king, you're so down on this stuff and things, okay? Jezebel says, okay, Ahab, you're the king. What are, you, what are you, you know, down in your bed sullen? He says, she says, don't worry about it, Ahab. I will take care of it. What do you want for Christmas, Ahab? You want his vineyard? I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. I'll take care of it, Jezebel says. Now, when Jezebel says that, is that going to be bad news? Jezebel says this, and I want to introduce a concept that I want to call religious evil. Could Jezebel have just ordered her men to go out and kill him? She could have just ordered her men to go out and kill him. Is that what she does? No, she doesn't. Here's how Jezebel kills this guy Naboth. She says, proclaim a day of fasting and seat Naboth in a prominent place. So it's a day of fasting. It's a religious ceremony. Naboth is put in a prominent place among the people. But seat two scoundrels opposite him. Notice two scoundrels. You need two people as witnesses to convict a person opposite him and have them testify that he has cursed both God and the king and then take him out and stone him to death. Naboth was killed, was he killed using the law of blasphemy? She used the law of blasphemy to kill him. This was Jehovah's law. She uses Jehovah's law to kill this guy. Is that wicked? Is it like double wicked? It's kind of like cheating in a Bible class, okay? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you're going to cheat in class and stuff. If you cheat in a Bible class, is that like really bad, okay? I'm sorry, but it's just, you know... What I'm saying. So she's she's going to use religion. She's going to use religion to to destroy Naboth. She uses religion, and it, rather than just killing the guy. So this is what I want to call religion. Do people hide behind religion to do evil? Do people hide behind religion to do evil? Yes, they do, and they code it with this religious stuff, and it's it's incredible. Jezebel does that. God comes. By the way, there is a God. He sees what happens, and so guess who shows up? Who's the prophet? Elijah shows up. He goes after Ahab, and he says, Ahab, you're a dead man, man. Dogs, where the dogs licked up Naboth's blood, the dogs are going to lick up your blood, Naboth, or Ahab. And then he comes to Jezebel, and he says, Jezebel, you set that up. The dogs are going to eat you. You're going to be eaten by dogs, man. You're, you're, you know, you're done. Now, what happens, listen to what the Bible says. There was never, this is uh, chapter 21, verse 25, there was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by his wife 
Jezebel, his wife, is Ahab the worst of the worst. But what happens here? Next verse. And when Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. What's this guy doing? Yeah. Ahab repents. I mean, this is the wickedest guy that lived in the northern kingdom. This guy repents when the Lord, check this out, it's like God's, when the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, he says, have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring disaster on in his day, but I will bring it on his, the day in the house of the days of his son. Is Ahab spared? Ahab is spared. He repented. This guy is like the worst, wickedest person in the Old Testament. This guy repents, and God spares him. And that brings me back. Some people say there isn't much grace in the Old Testament. Question, is this grace? This is grace. This guy who just butchered this Naboth, bless you, and done all these bad things, and God spares him. Is, is the Old Testament full of grace as well? The answer is yes. God is gracious in both Testaments. the same God. And God spares Ahab here. My other point is this. Is it possible that in your life you will do something that's so bad that you'll say, God can't forgive me for this? God can't forgive me? Question, if a person repents, does God forgive? Even if it's an Ahab. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So <laughs> Ahab is like worst of the worst. He repents. God says, I won't, I won't bring disaster on in your day and that thing. So now here are some dates to know. These are just some quick things, and then I want to hit something else. David's a thousand. That's easy. Okay, here's a new one. The northern kingdom is deported to Assyria. What's the capital of Assyria? Nineveh. That's Jonah's territory in 722. And then when does the temple get this? Oh, I forgot to talk to you guys about the Samaritans. Do you guys know who the Samaritans are? Jesus and the, remember the woman of Samaria and things? The northern kingdom, when Assyria took those ten tribes away, they left the poor people in the land. The Assyrians then brought in other peoples and had them intermarry with these poor Jews. So the Samaritans are half-breeds set up by the Assyrians who basically took the, most of the middle class and up. They didn't really have a middle class, but anyways, took, took the wealthy and intelligence away and left only the poor people. And then they brought other groups in that intermarried with the Jews, and those people became the Samaritans. That's why the Samaritans are so despised in the New Testament. They're half-breeds. They're, they're the, the lowest class Jews who intermarried with these people. And so Jesus will run into that uh, prejudice in his day. Now, Judah got deported to Babylon in 586. What also happened in 586? What's the most important thing? The temple is destroyed. 586. Judah gets deported to Babylon in 586. The temple is deported. And then the last date, and these are the four big dates that I was wanting you to know for this semester. The return to the end of the Old Testament. Ezra and Nehemiah, and I call this guy Malachi, the last of the Italian prophets. Anyways, but he's the last prophet. Okay, um, I keep thinking Malachi now, but actually it's Malachi. Uh, Malachi. Anyways, Malachi. Malachi ends at 400 B.C. So after 400 B.C., the prophecy thing is kind of over. Okay, After 400 B.C., the prophecy thing ends with Malachi. And until the time of Jesus, you've got, what, about 400 years? They call them the silent years. Is that when the Apocrypha is written? Okay, so from Malachi, 400 B.C., to the time of Christ, that's basically when the Apocrypha stuff is written. And it's, you know, you don't, until Jesus comes around, Jesus comes around zero, right? Wrong. But anyways, we'll talk about that in the New Testament. So you got about 400 years after that. Now, yes, um, Peter. What kingdom was Babylon the capital of? Babylon was the capital of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Okay, there was an old Babylonian Empire, you know Hammurabi. Hammurabi, old Babylonian kingdom. They kind of went down the tubes. Assyria came up. Assyria was the big one. And in 612 B.C., Babylon destroyed Nineveh in 612, and then Babylon was on a roll. Nebuchadnezzar and all those guys, and then Babylon became big for the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And then who took over after the Babylonians? Do you remember that? Cyrus the Persian. Do you guys remember the Persians? The Persians came in and wiped out Babylon. And that was about 539, well, 70 years after. You know the, anyways, so the Persians come in. Who comes after the Persians? 
Yeah, the Greeks, the 300 come, the Greeks wipe the Persians out, and then the Persians, then the Greeks are what? And then who's after the Greeks? No one. The Romans stole all the stuff from the Greeks. Anyway, so, sorry, I have a bad view of the Romans, but anyways.